What up, guys and ghouls, and welcome to another frightfully good episode of Fright Mike. (laughs) I'm Liz. I'm Sam. And we are in our last month of November. Noir November. (laughs) Noir November. What a fun theme. I know. This so we were just discussing. This has been an unexpectedly good month for us. Um who knew that we liked noir movies so much? I didn't. <laughs> what a what a nice surprise. But unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end, and we are ending with a an interesting pick, I'll say. Yes. And yes. interesting nonetheless. We are gonna be talking about Blue Velvet. So Directed by David Lynch, Woo! Blue Velvet. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Things are getting weird. <laughs> I love David Lynch. Uh, yeah, I do too. It's fucking bonkers. Have you ever? Do you ever follow him on Twitter at all? He like has. I think it's every Friday he posts like his like deep thoughts. <laughs> I love that. And everything, and it's like he makes like these videos, and oh, they're just so fucking great. He's so wacky. I love it. See, I'm on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter. Like I have one. Because when I was in cosmetology school, my friends were like, you have to get on Twitter. So I have a Twitter account. I never go on Twitter. I <laughs> go don't on Twitter. That's where, <laughs> that's where all the sassy people are. <laughs> uh, I didn't I'll like going it. on Twitter for the majority of 2020, though, because it was all like, fucking, the uh. yeah. <laughs> You know, everybody... Yeah, I mean, so negative. It, I mean, I, I agreed with most people, but I still didn't want to hear it. I wanted to be boxed out of... <laughs> The drama of all last year. Yeah. But, um... We'll have to go on just for the David Lynch deep thoughts. Yeah, right? I, I love him. I feel like there were times where people would be like, describe, like, if you had to describe yourself, describe yourself. And I'd be like, I don't know, I feel like if David Lynch and, like, Bill Burr had a child, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Weird, but comedic. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, super fucking weird, but also, like, angry and funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, though, that this movie in particular is not one of my favorites of his. Off the bat. It's, Spoilers. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> higher than Eraserhead, but lower than Mulholland Drive. Yeah. That's a good way to describe it, I think. Yeah. yeah. And Wild at Heart's in there somewhere, <laughs> and so is Inland Empire, I mean, but, yeah. Eraserhead. Eraserhead. I don't like Eraserhead more than this. But this isn't my favorite one of his. Yeah. It's not bad. It's not bad, but it's not great. I feel like this movie isn't, I don't know, maybe this is like a hot take. I feel like this movie isn't as weird as people think it is. (laughs) I don't think it's weird, but I do think there are weird elements, like, um like, David Lynch elements. Yeah. And I do think Dennis Hopper is what makes this movie... I think this movie is uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I'll you say it, yeah. Like, Eraserhead is weird and uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. This is less weird-leaning and just more uh, dark and uncomfortable. Well, yeah, and it's not as deep as, like, Mulholland Drive. I mean, there's, like, there's still fan theories going around of what the hell is going on with that movie, and I know we're going to cover it one day, so. I have so much to say. I have so much to we're say. We're going to be at the drawing board. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Charlie from <laughs> It's Always Sunny, like, just trying to figure out where the fuck this movie goes. Fuck yes. But this, and this movie isn't like that at all, I feel like. It's very, it's straightforward in a way, but also it is, it is odd in, in, in parts of it. I'll, I'll say that. But I don't know. I, I hadn't seen the entire thing before this because I think I had started it and I fell asleep. I don't know. And so, so I guess technically this was a first time watch for me, but I didn't find it as odd as people say it is. I know my dad really liked this movie. Uh, I know, well, I know my dad really liked Isabella Rossellini. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know if you guys caught it. I did give you a hint. So Isabella Rossellini is the daughter of Ingrid Bergman, who was in another movie for our Noir Vember. Uh, she was the lead Paula in Gaslight. So we have... A whole family a whole affair. Family, <laughs> yes. Wrapping the month up. I'm with Isabella Rossellini. She has who, the same pout as her mom. Same pout. Same, like, voice. Yeah. Same voice. Um, 
She's gorgeous. She's got a little bit of, like, a Frankenfurter hair situation in this movie, <laughs> like, <laughs> Rocky Horror. It's, I don't, I'm not loving the hair situation. It is interesting. Very 80s. Very, like, bushy brows. Like, a lot of hair. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of hair. Yeah. But, yeah, this movie for me was a second time watch? Third time watch? Uh, I think it's, I think it's second time. Because I know I would seen clips of it. But I watched it for the first time in our film class. Or I should, I should, I should say our film class because we had the same teacher. But we were not in the same class. Man. Justin's class. Justin's class. Yes. <laughs> and I remember, like, watching this movie and just being like, I didn't want to be in class that day. I wasn't really into the noir genre. I just, like, you know those days you're just, like, you're not feeling it. Yeah. You know? And so I came away and I was like, I didn't really care for it. Like, it was not my favorite David Lynch movie at all. I didn't really want to watch it again. And then sitting down to watch it again, years later, I'm older, I'm wiser, I've seen some shit. I sat down to watch it and I was like, actually, this is a good movie. I, I liked it a lot better the second time around. Like, I noticed a lot more things. Um, probably just because I've seen more David Lynch movies now that, like, I picked up more on, like, his style. Yeah. Um, and he has, like, a lot of subtle clues in his movies. Yeah. Some not so subtle, but there's definitely, like, more to it than just <laughs> right. like, what we're shown. The lighting is always very, like, dark. Like, it's either, like, really bright, like, the beginning of the movie, or it's, like, very weird, dark lights. Like, um, how do I say it? Like, the contrast of, like, the colors to the lighting. Yeah. Like, in that scene where they go... To that guy's house and there's like a cast of character I, it's so hard if you haven't seen a david lynch movie but it's those it always feels like it's from the 50s but maybe not in the 50s yeah you know that's what you're saying it's, it's kind of muted too exactly this movie is very dark i yes. feel like anytime they're in her apartment it's you know like it's like it's weird because it's dark but then she has like doesn't she have like red carpeting? <laughs> like yeah. bright red? I don't know. It's it is a very I feel like it's a very dark movie. And most of it takes place like at night, I feel like. Most and, of the scenes are at night. And this movie is like a commentary. So Mulholland Drive is a commentary on Hollywood and like the glossy, like forward presenting side of Hollywood and really like the underbelly, like the darkness of like what Hollywood is. And this movie is kind of similar, except it has to do with the suburbs. Like, we open very literally with bright colors. Like, very Edward Scissorhands. It's very like, pleasant, though. <laughs> yeah, it's white picket fences. Really, really bright red roses. Really bright green grass. Like, blue, blue skies. Like, American family, traditional, like, whatever. And then it slowly sinks underground. We see a man have a heart attack, and it sinks below the ground, and it's very dark, and it's dirty, and there's bugs and it's the under the underbelly <laughs> yes the underbelly the underlying darkness that lies within this quote-unquote like white picket fence suburbia perfect life it, it's all about Ooh. that <laughs> yes so that's why like when you see laura dern it's always in the daytime it's always or i should say it's mostly yeah during the daytime and everything's a little bit more softer and a little bit you know whatever and with isabella rossellini it's so dark it is and it's it's actually that contrast it, it's crazy because when you see her she's like an all-american girl and it, you know yeah like you said everything it starts off in the daytime and we got this guy um jeffrey who like comes home to kind of help run his family business because the man that fell to the ground is his father who ended up having a heart attack? Stroke? Stroke? Heart something. attack? Something. So he ended up in the hospital. So he kind of came home from college, which... He's, he's in college. He's in college. <laughs> he does not look like he's in college. He, he is a lot older. 35. <laughs> he is 40-year-old man in college. <laughs> and it's Kyle McLaughlin. Yeah. Kyle McLaughlin, who was also in Twin Peaks. Who is which also, is a David Lynch show. Who is also in Flintstones. <laughs> Amen. Yes. He's what, Rockefeller? Yeah. Yes. I gotta stop thinking about that, man. <laughs> oh, I love I've seen Marlin. you in a dress with a bone necklace <laughs> barefoot. <laughs> Highly. <laughs> Viva Rock Vegas. 
To be more specific, um, not the original Flintstones movie. The second, no, he was. no, you're right, he is. It's I, th- a different I was gonna guy. say, I thought he was because I remember him yes. having scenes with like Halle Berry. Yes, you're right. Sorry, my b- wait. Yeah, I think Halle Berry's in the second one. I don't you know, know what? Who cares? Watch them both. <laughs> <laughs> I love those movies. I do too. <laughs> the Flintstones movies. Watch them both. Report back oh. to us. <laughs> How come they never made a Jetsons live action movie? <laughs> <gasps> too too complicated. Ooh. They could now. They have they have the effects. <laughs> True, they do. They do. Uh, Back then, you were asking for too much. <laughs> yeah, really. Um. Anyway, I don't even remember what I was saying. Oh, yeah. So the contrast. So she's an all American girl, and he's like an all American boy, and then it's just really jarring when. You know, we get to, like, him in the apartment, you know, snooping around. Everything is just so dark, and we get to, like, the gritty part of town with these horrible people who are just fucking yeah. worse. It's barely, it's like a, like a 180 completely. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, it's in the same, it's always how, like, every, every city, every town has the good part of town and the bad part of town. Like, it's, like, over the tracks, kind of. You know, don't go... Don't South go down the Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so she's in the bad part of town, but really, so the cool part of this movie too is it's bookended by an ear, believe it or not. Um, That's like the weirdest element that pops up first. <laughs> yeah. So we, Jeffrey is walking home one day, and he finds in this like open field, he just finds a human ear, like a severed ear, and he puts it in a brown paper bag that he also finds in the field. Uh, and, like, the camera, like, it, like, zooms in very literally to the ear. So it's like we're going into the story, into the, to the ear. What a transition. <laughs> right. And he brings it to the police, um, who is Laura Dern's character's dad. So her character's name is Sandy? Yeah. Yes. I, I actually think this is, like, I laughed out loud at this part where he, like, walks into the police station. He's like, I found an ear! <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh! But I guess how else do you react to finding an ear? True, You True. just gradually walk in, <laughs> all chill. They, they like, immediately begin an investigation on this ear. I feel like, in a way, that makes sense, because there's a, a gross severed ear, so it clearly belongs to someone... But also, they just seem very into this ear. Yeah. Um, so they start, like, we see them, like, starting their investigation on the ear. Uh, later, the cop's name, his last name is Williams. Or his first name is Williams? No, his last name is Williams. Uh, he goes to his house, and he's, like, asking him more questions about the ear. And he's like, hey, uh, buddy, I'm gonna need you to not talk about the ear. For reasons. My Investigative reasons. reasons. <laughs> yes. Investigative reasons. Um, it'll jeopardize the case, so why don't you just do us all a favor and shut the fuck up? (laughs) Which he does. (laughs) Not not really, because he immediately then meets Sandy, Laura Dern, who was a child in this movie. I know, she's so young. She's so young. She's also in another, um, David Lynch movie called Wild at Heart, which is so far away from this movie. (laughs) She's... She plays a girl named Lula, and uh, her love interest is Nicolas Cage. Hey, Nicolas Rage. And it is so weird. <laughs> They're all weird. All these I movies know. are so bizarre. I know. It's great. It's it's wild at heart. It's wild. Well, they hit it off immediately. <laughs> sure do. Even though she has a boyfriend. It's but fine, though. He's super into her. I feel like he's into her at first because like, her dad is the lead on this case, and she's like... I can tell you information about this ear. I overheard them talking. And there's all the suspicious activity around this lady who sings at this club. And I know where she lives. Her name is Dorothy. Uh, he's really excited. He's like, we should so, investigate. So much, in <laughs> fact, that he has a plot to break into her apartment <laughs> to yeah. find more evidence. For this what? Like, this, like, completely escalates to me. He's, like, Hardy Boys. He's, like, the yeah. Hardy Boys. He's why does he care about this so much? I, I don't have understand. No idea. Mm-hmm. They never really get into why. It's not like he's going to detective school. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to the Scooby-Doo Institute of Detectivism. He's he's just a, a white guy who yeah. found an ear and decided he's going to figure this one out himself. This is a case for 
Jeffy Dahmer. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffy Dahmer. <laughs> Jeffrey Beaumont. Sure. Sure, well, Jan. <laughs> he, like, poses as a as a, an exterminator to get into her apartment to try to open a window or something and ends up stealing her um, spare key. <laughs> yeah, he, she, so she lets him into the apartment and she's, like, so disheveled. She's like, what? What do you want? Ugh, I guess. And while he's in the apartment doing his fake investigation, there's a knock on the door that distracts her enough to, for him to grab the spare key that's just hanging there. Yeah. I, it, that is weird. It's just a key. Yeah, it's so bizarre, but it's this man in a yellow jacket. So they call him the yellow man for the rest of the movie. Um, but he steals the key, and then he's talking to Dorothy, and he's like, we have to go back. Um, I don't know. Sandy just seems not down for any of this, but because she kind of flubbed this first act, she's like, oh, I have to make it up to you. I think she's just bored. Yeah. I think she's like, I don't want to be a part of this, but I'll drive. <laughs> right, I'm the getaway driver. I won't go in, but I'll wait outside. Yeah. It seems like a really small town where not a whole lot happens, so the fact that they're, like, they're finding body parts in a field. Yeah. <laughs> this is, like, the the thing that, the only interesting thing that's ever happened in this town. And it's, uh, it's kind of crazy, this time period that, the, that we're in. It reminds me so much of... Um, it follows because a lot of it does feel like you're in the 50s, but they never specifically say the 50s. Right. There's really nothing to tie it to that time. It just, it feels like the 50s. I could see that. You know, like, there's not really any, like, old cars, but they're not new cars because this movie came out in 1986. Oh, we didn't even do, like, ratings. I'm sorry. I feel like I just, like, we just went right into it. We were just so excited. I know. Yeah, this movie came out in 1986. And it has a 7.7 out of 10 on IMDb, so that's pretty damn high. It has a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so sorry. Um, it Nothing feels like it came from the 80s, but nothing specifically is, like, they're not like, one day in 1957, you know? I yeah. don't know. And there's not really a, a lot of music. They do play... Blue Velvet. Or so many times. So many <laughs> times. And then later on, a song by Roy Orbison is used, which also, me just being a big Mulholland Drive fan and David Lynch fan, Roy, Roy, oh my god, Roy Orbison is also not directly used in Mulholland Drive, but a song by Roy Orbison called Crying is sung in Spanish in Mulholland Drive. And now Ooh. in this movie they do Roy Orbison's Are you coming in, in with dreams. the facts? <laughs> I know. I'm just a psycho and I love <laughs> I love I love Mulholland Drive so much. It's so good. We debated putting this in for Noir November, but we didn't know if it was noir enough. <laughs> yeah. Plus we could have, I guess we could have paired it with this movie, but I feel like that's too much David Lynch. A for lynch one off. <laughs> right. oh, a lynching? A that lynching. sounds so bad. <laughs> No, no. Um, this was enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this movie was a lot. Because I feel like this this episode is going to be... I don't want it to be, like, long, but I feel like Mulholland Drive, just because I'm such a fan. Are we going to have another Midsummer situation? <laughs> I'm not... No, I I won't go that... Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. Never say never. Justin Bieber. So Jeffrey breaks into her apartment that night. And after they see her in the club. Yeah, after they see her in the club singing Blue Velvet. Yeah. And it the plan... So the plan is for Sandy to honk the horn, like, what, four times when she sees people coming in. Of course, he, like, takes it upon himself to, like, walk, go into the apartment and use her bathroom immediately. Yes. Yes, because what do you do other than leave, leave evidence? evidence. <laughs> And, like, what do you, I mean, I know he's looking for evidence. He is looking for evidence, but he's leaving his paw prints all over the place. Yeah, and also, what do you expect to find? Like, this woman's not a killer. She's a sad, I know. lonesome-looking, seeming woman. Yeah. Who sings at a nightclub. I know. Everything is hearsay for yeah. this movie. That's why I'm like, what was he looking to find? I have no idea. All you did was find an ear. And maybe there's a connection with this woman, but there's no other damning evidence. <laughs> it's so wild. Like, it goes, he gets so involved, and it goes so off the rails. <laughs> I think he's just bored. I think everyone in this movie is just bored, and that's the only reason why it happens. And that's why perfection is an illusion, and it's boring. 
Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that was supposed to be for. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, he flushes the toilet, which is apparently so loud that he can't hear the horn four times, four consecutive times. Yeah. And Dorothy comes in to the house. Let me tell you the anxiety I get anytime there's a movie where someone is not where they're supposed to be and the other person, like, comes home. I'm like, oh, God! (laughs) It's insane. It happens a lot in the show You, and I just, I, I can't. Joe Goldberg, the homie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh god, he's gonna. How do you guys see him? He's under your time. bed. He's in your fucking shower. Which also gives me anxiety, thinking about my own life. Like when I come home and I'm like, who's under my couch? <laughs> <laughs> There's all those TikToks right now of people who are, like, sitting on the toilet and they're like, when I convince myself there's a serial killer in my shower. Yes! <laughs> and they're just singing and all of a sudden they just, like, rip the shower curtain open. <laughs> the amount of times I do that is astounding. Ugh. Truly astounding. Yeah. I actually tried to squeeze myself under my own bed to see if anyone could squeeze under the bed. <laughs> That's planning. Hey, if you ever needed to get under there, you know, you would know if you fit or not. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert, I don't. So you are, <laughs> So don't try it. I don't think that's a good place to hide anyway, under the bed. Yeah. His, his spot is not good either. He hides in the, like, the only closet in her apartment. Yeah. The only one that we can see. Yeah. Yeah. And she figures it out right quick. Yeah, I think he moves something. Yeah. And she just immediately knows that someone's there. Yeah. And yeah. she's, like, crazy. She's, like, wielding a knife at him, and she's, like, dah, 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 dah. she's, like, screaming at him. Uh, and then... It's kind of crazy because they, <laughs> she, she makes him undress. Yeah. And then she doesn't perform oral sex, but it's, the it's in the you. neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. She's right it's up a, in there. It's around the town. <laughs> <laughs> She's circling the restaurant. <laughs> um, which is already super weird because she still has him like kind of by knife point she's like take your boxers down do you like that <laughs> like it is such a weird 15 minutes of this movie what what ensues next <laughs> yeah so. she's basically seducing him i think she likes the fact that he was like peeping on her uh-huh because so, she has no idea why he's there he he she questions why but she, she just thinks he's like a pervert trying to get her his rocks off yeah um, Which at this point, I kind of believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, like, if you didn't think that was weird. Oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's real weird. Because in enters Frank, played by Dennis Hopper. Who always plays an asshole in movies. <laughs> always. He's so wild <laughs> in this movie. Uh, he says fuck as every other word, every punctuation, every other word, he says it, I believe, oh my god, I wrote it down, um, I think it was like 57 times or something like that, and the only time any other character says fuck that isn't him is one time by another character because Frank forced him to. So any, any time you hear the word fuck in this movie is coming from him. There's your R rating. There you go. Uh, but he comes in, and she's like, get in the closet! And she opens the door for him, and she has this blue velvet robe, and he, like, she says, hey, baby, and he's like, it's daddy, you dumb fuck! And, like, just... Beats the shit out of her. Really does. Like, beats beats on her pretty bad, uh, makes her call him daddy, And then he's really weird about the blue velvet robe, and he's, like, got it in his mouth, and (laughs) it's, like... It's an entire scene of bizarre sexual fetishes. Yeah. Like, sadomasochism. Yeah, really, really fucking weird. Yeah. Um, Props to him for acting that scene out. (laughs) I feel like, was he acting? (laughs) I feel like this was just him. I know. We just need the weirdest person in Hollywood to walk in the room and do this scene. Right. Just go for it. Yeah. Uh, so he has sex with her. I, I don't know if I can call it rape, so I won't, but it's 
I don't know. It's a weird it's situation because it's pimp territory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, like, beats her up, bangs her. Meanwhile, Jeffrey leaves. is watching all of this from the closet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real R. Kelly situation. Yeah. Well, didn't he have a song, like, where he's hiding in the closet or something? I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Trapped in the closet? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. How do I know that? I know. Songs oh, of our God. youth. <laughs> yeah. I think I think it's because it was a running joke for so long, but yes. now, uh, now it's not. Yeah, now he's just disgusting. Anyway, so, anyway, so he, he leaves, Frank leaves, and, uh, <laughs> but, and then Jeffrey wants to leave because, obviously, he has seen too much. <laughs> yeah. And he's weirded out, but she kept, keeps saying she wants him to stay. It's just so fucking weird, man. They just met. What the hell's going on? I don't even know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I did, uh, I did have to laugh, though, so, like, when Frank, when, like, right after he enters and he's like, call me daddy, then he says... Where's my bourbon, you stupid bitch? I just thought of like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but yeah, so she's like, um, I want you to stay. Like we should, we should still bang. Like you're still into it, right? You want to hit me? You should hit me. I mean, you should probably hit me. And he's like, I, no. <laughs> and it's really weird. And he like leaves. He finds that picture before he leaves. Oh. The picture of her husband. Yeah. And her son. Yeah, and I think it's so wild that he just, just from watching those 15 minutes of her and Frank and then seeing this photo, he makes the inference that... Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he makes this wild inference that uh, Frank is a bad man, we know this, um, but Dorothy has a husband and a son that Frank has captured and is holding them hostage because he wants to use them as leverage to have sex with Dorothy. Man, that's a lot to infer off of a picture. <laughs> yes. Especially from someone who's not a cop, not a detective, just a college boy. And he's watched this woman for a total of, like, 25 minutes. Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot of information. And the fucked up thing is, it ends up being true. Yeah, but, uh- like... <laughs> <laughs> But, like, how did you know all of that? Right. That's the thing. Going (laughs) in. You you figured that out from a photo, and then it's true? Are you kidding? I mean, pictures, you know, they say pictures say a thousand words. (laughs) That picture said nothing to me. Told an entire story. (laughs) Right. So it's really fucking weird. Um, But he wants to, like, I mean, basically Jeffrey cannot wait to tell Sandy what he's found. Yeah. She was really into it, too. Yeah. But she, they can't go to the police because, obviously, he found out illegally. <laughs> yeah. Everything so, that's... For, he broke in, so, you know. They can't use that's any a no-no. evidence. Right. So, instead, he decides to do the stakeout. <laughs> yeah. And he, follow this, like, horrible person around. He goes back to the slow club to watch Dorothy, and then he sees Frank there, who's crying while she's singing Blue Velvet... <laughs> And holding on to a piece of the velvet robe, and then... It reminds me of the creepy thin man from Charlie's Angels with the hair. Yes! (laughs) (laughs) It's so fucking true. Like, why? It's so true. Um... But, yeah, after the slow club, Jeffrey follows not only Frank, but Frank's, like, three cronies as well. One of them happens to be Brad Dorif. Hey! Who's the voice of Chucky! And for a brief period in, like, the first one, plays Charles Lee Ray, the person. <laughs> the serial killer? Yes. Um, so, love to see it. I, I'm gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it, that in this movie, I did have a crush on Brad Dorf. Oh, yeah, he's cute. <laughs> he's super <laughs> cute. I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> He looks a little messed oh. out by the time Child's Play came out. True. Which was actually, I think it was, like, a couple years after this movie. Yeah, not too much longer yeah. after this. I don't know why he looks so much older than I think. <laughs> I think it's... No, because he had longer hair in this movie, too. Yeah. That's fine. I don't know. I don't I don't know. know. Anyway, he's hot, but... <laughs> yeah, so, like, like you said, he follows them and he does, like, a stakeout. And then I think he tells Sandy, right, about his findings. Yeah. And then there's that whole gruesome murder that happens, like, not too far from where he was staking out with the drug dealer and... The guy hanging out the window and the dead woman. It's a lot of specifics that really don't lead anywhere except for when Jeffrey comes clean to Sandy's dad later that he found all this evidence. 
Yeah. Of like, you know, and then there's the yellow man, and then there's the well dressed man, and then they went and they there's met so many and men. Then <laughs> I know there's so many men with no names, which I feel like is a David Lynch thing. Yeah. You know, it's all these. It's his movies include a lot of like wild characters that don't have names but have names. You know, like in this, it's the yellow man and the well dressed man, and in Mulholland Drive, it's like the cowboy. You know, and like the thing behind the dumpster, like the monster, and like I just. All these crazy characters. Very ominous. It's very noir. It is. Because we mentioned that a lot, when, we, especially when we were talking about dementia, I believe, mm-hmm. of how a lot of the, because <clears throat> because it was such a nightmarish, like, set yeah. and movie, a lot of the people are faceless. They're just there to be, like, shadows on the wall. Yeah. And that's kind of how this movie is a lot. There's a lot of people that may not really be involved with what's going on but they're just there right they're like um they're background people right they're on the the outer what is it like they're on the outside on the perimeter yeah they're peripheral people yeah and they all are just so uh you can't tell if they're good or bad what their deal is but they're just there yeah they're in somebody's pocket. Exactly. <laughs> because the way the police are acting about this whole thing is they could be in on something, too. The fact that he said off the bat, don't tell anybody about this, don't ask questions, don't get involved, it makes me think, okay, so they found an ear and they now they have to cover up something for this, like, group of people, this whatever they are, mob, mob people. <laughs> exactly. So. Who to believe? <laughs> <laughs> So, after this, like, cast of characters, Jeffrey, like, he's still, he's super obsessed. I think even Sandy's like, I mean, you're not gonna, like, continue this, right? And he's like, no, I feel like, and, okay, so then another crazy thing about this movie. So, when him and Sandy, they keep meeting up at this diner, and there's a part in the movie where he's telling her all this, and he goes, I feel like I'm in the middle of a mystery. That line comes directly in the middle portion of the movie. It is the exact dead middle of the movie, so it's fun. Um, (laughs) But he's like, I mean, I have to. I'm going to see this through. And he goes back to Dorothy's apartment where they finally bang. And he, like, he does. He hits her finally. Yeah, there's some dinosaur noises happening, too. (laughs) Yeah. He, they bang. Um, But then as he's, I think it's as he's leaving, Frank and friends. (laughs) Frank and friends! (laughs) They... They all kind of, like, meet outside Dorothy's apartment, and Frank is like, I see what's, ah, we're all, oh, he's your neighbor. Oh, okay, neighbor. Well, let's go on a joyride. And this is, like, so wild, so crazy. They are driving, like, super fast and reckless. Um, She's got the, he insists that she puts on the blue robe. He loves this blue velvet robe. And, um... They go to this guy Ben's house. Ben is really weird. <laughs> oh, do they Ben's go to the bar first? Or is that after? They go somewhere because... I think they go after. Okay. Because I know um, Frank makes a big deal about PBR. <laughs> oh, okay. the Heineken? Yes, the fucking God Heineken. Heineken. Yeah, fuck Heineken. The PBR, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> so wild. And then, they, yeah, they go to this guy Ben's house, and they keep talking about, like, Oh, Ben's a cool guy. What do they keep saying about him? They're like, he's so chill. He's a cool guy. Well, she ben, is a cool he's... guy. <laughs> yes. He's just so, like, fair. laissez-faire. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, he's whatever. And that's when we learn that her son is actually there. <laughs> yes. And then I believe Jeffrey overhears the conversation between Frank and Ben about, like, the drug deal that went south or whatever. Yeah. So all the shenanigans. He's putting all these pieces together. Dorothy is allowed to go see her son for just like ten minutes, uh, and then Ben picks up like an old lamplight, you know, kind of like a fifty style microphone, but it's got the lamp, like a light in it, and he starts lip syncing to Roy Orbison's song "In Dreams," and also Dennis Hopper is kind of lip syncing along too from like the side, <laughs> uh, and that song does come up again a little bit later, so. Uh, Brad Dorf's character, I know they say his name, I don't, I don't remember it, but he picks up, like, a hooker, they leave Ben's house, and, um, 
go for a joyride where they end up in like an industrial part of town. I don't know why this portion of the movie reminds me so much of like Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Like, I think it's just like the group of people hopping in the car, us getting the perspective of the car and going from location to location. It's, it's just very Quentin Tarantino. I think it's the style. I think it's this like neo, like I don't even know what you, like a neo historical 50s like because pulp fiction is very like i guess yeah pulpy yeah i guess where it feels 50s but it's also somehow current and Mm -hmm. everyone has that in between style and the music is old but like i like it lives in a time that is (laughs) right right it's this weird time it almost kind of feels like they live in an era where, like, maybe Elvis and Marilyn Monroe, like, didn't die. Ooh. You know, like... An alternate David an alter- Lynchian yes. universe. It's this weird <laughs> sub-universe. But I do, I 100% agree with you that it does feel very, like, Tarantino-esque. I swear there's gotta be, like, how they have, like, a Marvel cinematic universe. It's like a David Lynch cinematic universe. For sure, for sure. Just like fucking Quentin Tarantino. He has his own little universe yes. with his Easter eggs within all of his movies. So. Absolutely. Man, so creativity. The, right. And they, they feel very, like, similar worlds, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so they pull up in this industrial area, area, and Jeffrey hits Dennis Hopper, like, punches him. And so they pull him out of the car, and this, like, weird prostitute puts on the radio. Like, well, I think the radio is on, and I don't remember who changes the radio station, but then Roy Orbison's In Dreams is playing again, and Dennis Hopper is quoting the song to him, and the prostitute is dancing on the roof of the car. <laughs> uh, it's so weird. And they beat up Jeffrey pretty bad, and Dorothy's, like, screaming to, like, stop it and leave him alone. And in the morning, Jeffrey is left there, beaten and bloodied, and he walks home and cries. <laughs> because it's so weird! Yeah, and then he even spots the yellow man uh, talking to the police. No, he's in the police station, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he, he, he goes, goes to the police station, finally, to, like... Confess. Basically, yeah, confess everything that he's done and seen and everything. And then he sees him there. And then he runs and tells Sandy's dad, the detective, about everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, because now we know that the yellow man is working for the police department. Yeah. So it's an in, like it's not an inside job, but it's like they have a man on the inside. Yeah. And so the shit goes deep. It's really weird, too, because then all of a sudden there's a, a school dance. <laughs> yeah. And Jeffrey and Sandy go to the dance, which the dance is, is it at an apartment? I don't Where is this at? I don't know, but he goes to pick her place. up. <laughs> yeah. And. It's very prom. <laughs> and it, I'm like, I thought you were in college. Where? Am she's I, in I, high school. I, yeah. She, okay. I guess it makes sense. Uh, and at some point down the line, she drops her boyfriend. <laughs> right. Because she is very insistent at first. She's like, I love my boyfriend. Okay, I'll get in the car with you, but I'm not into you, yeah. mister. And then her boyfriend sees her get into the car one time. She's like, it's like over. do you want to go talk? And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah. <sighs> so, like, at this dance scene, then they're, like, dancing to a slow song, and then they kiss, and then it's like, oh, they're in love. But then they're coming back from the dance, and there's a chase scene where they think it's Frank, but it's actually Sandy's ex-boyfriend. And they're in front of Jeffrey's house, where Dorothy now is just, like, completely naked on the front lawn. (laughs) I don't, like... As you are. (laughs) And then Sandy's ex-boyfriend's like, oh, hey, uh, I didn't mean any of it, man. Looks like you got your hands full here. Yeah, and then, like, they go into the house, and... You know, Sandy now sees what's been going on and basically puts everything together that Jeffrey's been kind of seeing Dorothy and is really fucking pissed. And they take Dorothy to the hospital. Yeah. And they, or they call and they wait for that. And, but she forgives him really quickly. She sure does. <laughs> like, they, he calls from the hospital and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. And she's like, I forgive you. Like, I'm like, oh my God. Right. Like, that was typical high school girl. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, but maybe it's because she also was a little bit trifling, too. Like, that's her true. <laughs> so, everyone made mistakes here. Yeah. Uh, but then he's like, I have to 
go back to the apartment one more time. And he does. And he walks in. Kind of seen. <laughs> she, yup. <laughs> That's the only way I could say. Shit happened there. <laughs> yeah. But we did not see it. But he walks in at the, like, the tail end of it. It's <laughs> wild. So the radio is on? Is the radio on? Something's yeah. happened. So, like, basically the scene is there's a dead man in a chair with, like, uh, is it, like, head trauma? I feel like there's head trauma. A lot of head trauma everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and the man in the chair who's dead is missing an ear, and that is Dorothy's husband. And there is a man standing, standing perfectly balanced, but he also has suffered severe trauma. He is bleeding. He has a radio, like a police radio, on his hip, and he's, like, alive but dead. I feel like he might be paralyzed. I don't know. He's alive, but he doesn't move ever. Right. (laughs) He's just kind of bleeding out. (laughs) Yeah. And Jeffrey's like, you know what? I'm gonna let the police deal with this. Good Good call. Good call. But then, Probably should have done that, like, two hours ago. <laughs> right, like, from from point one. Uh, but as Jeffrey's leaving, he thinks he sees the well-dressed man, and when he makes eye contact, it's actually Dennis Hopper in disguise. It's Frank in disguise. So they, like, ch- he chases him back into Dorothy's apartment, where he steals the police radio to call to Detective Williams to say that he's in the apartment, but then he remembers that Frank also has a police radio, so he says, I'm hiding in the back bedroom, but then hides in the closet. And then I couldn't Really tell... throwing him off. <laughs> right, and then he planted... He must have, at some point, planted the radio back in the bedroom. Um, because Dennis Hopper comes in, and he's like, don't you fucking remember that I fucking got a fucking radio, you fucking fuck? And he did. <laughs> he did. Word for word. <laughs> and so he goes to the back bedroom, and he's not in there. And he's hunting around the apartment, and he finally realizes... Oh, and he also, um, Jeffrey takes the guy's gun. Mm-hmm. So he's got a gun. And he, Jeffrey, or I'm sorry, Dennis Hopper finally realizes that he's hiding in the closet. And so he flings the closet doors open but is somehow surprised that jeffrey's in there and jeffrey just shoots him point blank in the head oh man the the amount of brain goop all over because then they flash back to him laying on the floor and there his brain is like five feet away from him yeah it's incredible (laughs) absolutely (laughs) there's no other there's no other way yes it's it's something it's something to see (laughs) And then literally right after, like, I think like a millisecond after this happens, uh, Detective Williams and Sandy come in. They're like, oh, la, la. Uh, and then he's like, it's over, Jeffrey, it's over. And <laughs> then we see a shot of, like, white picket fences again, and we zoom out of the ear, and Jeffrey and Sandy and their family, they're all, like, having lunch together, and... Jeffrey's dad is okay, and there was a whole scene that we didn't even talk about, about Laura Dern having this dream about Robins equating to love, and when the Robins are gone, the love is gone, and they see a Robin on a windowsill eating a bug, so it's to symbolize that love wins. Love conquers all. (laughs) Exactly. And then the last shot of the movie is Dorothy reunited with her son, and then just before the movie ends, they embrace, and then we hear her singing the song Blue Velvet. Again! <laughs> Again! For the 90th time! And then I believe the credit song Woo. is Blue Velvet by, who sings it? Bobby Valance? Bobby Valance. Yeah. Sure. So. <laughs> that's Blue Velvet! Blue Velvet! <laughs> Lana Del Rey did a cover of Blue Velvet for an H&M commercial, which was also very David Lynchian. Ooh. And I don't... I can't remember now, because I looked it up. She's a fan. <laughs> I think he directed the H&M commercial. Ooh. Very Man, cool. he's a, he, ha, he has the most interesting resume <laughs> so ever. True. He just... He's awesome, man. Incredible. He has a way of taking something so boring and ordinary and making it just... Just weird enough, this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to where you question it, but you also don't, because right. you know him. <laughs> You're like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> and yet, I believe it. <laughs> so.
So, let's get to our ratings of Blue Velvet. <laughs> we won't forget. Liz, what would you rate Blue Velvet? Uh, I'm going to give this movie a two and a half out of five for me. Because I don't believe I like it as much as you do. Maybe? I don't know. We'll see in like a second here. <laughs> but uh, I just thought it was okay. Uh, it was interesting enough. But, you know, it's, it kind of dragged at some parts. But a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah. Like, why? <laughs> just why, why? Just why being the main one. <laughs> I agree with that. I mean, that is... Yeah. Yeah. It, but, you know. It, like I said, it wasn't my favorite David Lynch movie. I think... I mean, I said that off the bat, so it shouldn't be too surprising that I didn't rate this, you know, as high as it could be, but... Yeah. How about you? I'm gonna go three and a half out of five. Ooh. Uh, I think had... Had this been my initial viewing... I would have also given it a two and a half out of five. Um, and like I said, when I first watched it in that film class, I was like, this fucking blows. Yeah. Like, it's slow at parts. I don't really, like, care about the characters. It just seems like one big question of why. Why did he get involved? Why is the ear? Why is anything? <laughs> um, but upon second viewing, I think uh, probably just because I've been... I, I've dived deeper into the Lynch pool. <laughs> uh, I could just see the correlation of things, and I just get more of his... St- I mean, not like like I get more of his style, but I, I think it appeals to me now that I know what I'm watching. Um, yeah. Seen, like, having seen it already, I yeah. can pick up on more of these things. Uh, I don't... Again, don't love it. Not my favorite David Lynch movie. Certainly does drag in some parts. Um, but... I liked it more than I initially did. I'll have to rewatch it at some point, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, maybe I'll feel differently, but yeah, maybe it was just because it was my one of my first times. <laughs> 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 my second attempt at watching, uh, because the first time I only got like 15 minutes in with it before I fell asleep, but you know, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I think it's easier to... I, and and not true for all movies because some movies are just trash. <laughs> yeah. But I think with something like this, it like with weird movies, uh, you have to almost like watch it the first time to be like, what the fuck? To soak it all in. <laughs> yeah. And then you're going in for that second watch. It's like, okay, well, I already know what this is. Let's let's watch it again and see if I appreciate it more. Like you know, with movies like The Lighthouse, with The Witch, with I like even for me, Hereditary. The first time I watched Hereditary, I remember texting my friend Mike and I was like, "What the fuck did I just watch?" I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I just was like confused. Yeah. And then I googled it literally the entire day the next day, and I was like, "Okay, this movie is fucking titties." And then watching it again, it's like, "I oh, I liked it so much more." I yeah. feel like this is one of those movies. Well, especially because it's a David Lynch movie, and I mean. People still talk about Mulholland Drive, like, their theories, because it just is so bizarre, and it could be this, it could be that, whatever, and I think, you know, I, when I initially saw Mulholland Drive, I was kind of like that, in that mindset of, what the hell did I just watch? So, maybe, like, this might not be on the same, like, tier or scope as Mulholland Drive, with, like, weirdness, and, like, just, like, these conflicting stories, and just, like, craziness, but... I think it is for both instances, both movies. Um, it it does better to watch them more than one time for sure. Because I I can see why you would say you picked up on more. Because I'm just looking at this movie at face value, just like the first time I watched Mulholland Drive. It was just face value, and I was like, huh. <laughs> yeah, and I think this like like you said, definitely a good point. Mulholland Drive has more of a mystery, more symbols more things to read into this movie uh is a little bit more just on the nose but again watching it it is just weird enough that when you're done you're like i don't know if i liked that because i really don't like wow what a what a story yeah it's almost what a like, story mark and i don't know his like i don't know david lynch's full full filmography but i feel like this if you told me this was the first movie he ever made i believe you because it's it's like it it's interesting enough and like kind of mainstream enough to be 
you know, accepted in Hollywood, but also it's, like, the start of weird his weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not full-blown lingy and crazy. It's wild. <laughs> but it's, like, just, you can see the sprinklings of weirdness of this movie. For sure. So, I don't think, I mean, obviously, I don't think this was his first movie. I'm, I'm almost positive it's not, but if you told me it was, I'd believe you. I think Eraserhead came before first. Wait, I'm gonna look it up now, because I'm curious, but... Um, and then it just got weirder from here because he got more comfortable with being, like, that director. <laughs> right. And he also has just, like, such a... A flair. <laughs> such a mind. Yeah. Like, the way that he tells stories... Yeah, Eraser came out in 77. Okay. Uh, he just has such a way of looking at things and crafting a story that is looking at something ordinary and making it... Just, like, flipping it on its head. Which I like. Also, I feel bad because I, I think I said, I texted my friend Mike. It's our friend Mike. We both know Michael. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to clarify because I don't know. Because I'm weird. <laughs> Alright, people. That is our opinion on Blue Velvet. Let us know what you think about the movie. Is it your favorite David Lynch movie? If not, what is? Let us know. know. Yes. <laughs> and you can comment on Facebook uh, we had, do have a, uh, a Facebook group, Fright Club, which so we fun. have opinions, funny memes, conversations. Head over there. Good times. Or you can uh, hit us up on Instagram and Twitter. We're on there at Fright Mike Podcast. If you are looking for more spooky content from us, we do have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Fright Mike Podcast for just a small, generous donation a month. We cover extra bonus episodes. We're doing new movies all month long. This uh, this past month, we covered Last Night in Soho, the much-anticipated yes. Edgar Wright film. There are so many things I want to say about it, but you'll have to join our Patreon if you want to hear. We give nothing away for free. <laughs> <laughs> also, we're on YouTube. Just our audio for now. We We're say it every there. week. We're getting but, there. <laughs> yes, we are working on it. So sorry. But subscribe to our YouTube channel and we can you can even comment there. We read the comments. That's true. We see you. I see you. I hear you. But be nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're fragile also. We are. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the horror fans that are the most fragile people. <laughs> I know. I mean, I can rip a movie apart for sure, but if someone's like, I think she sounds nice like a shirt, man. Nice shirt, asshole! <laughs> I just spiral. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a two-week bender. Also, if you have a moment, please, 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 if you don't mind, throw us a review wherever you are listening. We really would appreciate it. We would love to be able to reach out to more spooky people like yourselves. Share with a friend. Tell your dog. Tell your aunt. Tell your neighbor. Exactly. Tell, tell your enemy. Tell your enemy. Who cares? Your frenemies. Everybody. Yeah. But uh, I think that's it. Yeah. I plugged it all. Exactly. <laughs> Enough of our shilling. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I'm Liz. I'm Sam. Rest, Rest in, in peace. peace.